Hi there, my name is Stefan Dersinger. I'm the author of Space Between People and Der Veröffentlichte Raum on the subject of public space in the digital age. Thanks for the invitation to the hybrid symposium Virtual Real Playgrounds How to Digitally Expand the City at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. When we talk about public space, out of habit we usually think of built architecture. Out of habit we also consider digital technology as a medium within space. Let's question these habits for a moment. Let's leave the familiar paths and let me guide you through eight levels of the hybrid space to the rubber band rally. During our journey we will see that space isn't something solid. It is rather flexible and presents itself as something emerging. Under our feet, the city unfolds as a continuous process between our me memories and our perceptions. Call that the experience of duration. Even though the duration is undivided, it is elastic. Moments shrink and expand, just like a rubber band. So how does that work? Maybe Henri Bergson's concept of the relationship between body and mind will help us in our understanding. Matter, according to Henri Bergson, is the totality of images which we perceive in relation to the possible effect of one particular image, our own body. Conversely, we ourselves create spatial awareness by dividing the undivided duration into snapshots, by choosing which images are important to us and which are not. You might ask now, what is an image and how do digital images fit into this mix? Before we set off to the center of the digital machine, let's therefore start briefly with Bergson's concept of the image. By image, we understand a kind of existence that is more than what the idealist calls imagination, but less than what the realist calls thing. It is an existence in between. For him, these images circulate around like a power circuit between our inner and our outer worlds. More importantly, he derives the very idea of freedom from this process. Spirit borrows from matter the perceptions on which it feeds and restores them to matter in the form of movements which it has stamped with its own freedom. Perhaps the lack of freedom as defined by Bergson is what creates the fundamental conflict of the replicant in James Cameron's film Blade Runner from 1982. The replicant, a machine without memory, can't cope with the question about his mother and shoots the one that asks. Therefore, always be aware of replicants. But let's move on. Let's ask ourselves, what would happen if our rubber band were suddenly torn or put together incorrectly? Is that even possible? Well, of course. Anyone who loves films knows that. So let's enter the mechanical game with movement and time. In film, we use image cropping, perspective and editing to create flashbacks and play with the idea of before and after. In many films, such as Pulp Fiction by Quentin Tarantino from 1994, flashbacks are widely intercut. Effortlessly, however, our memory corrects the interrupted timeline and reconstructs the connections. We get the story even though Vincent is shot dead in the toilet within the first 10 minutes of the film. However, it becomes tricky when we talk about a film like Last Year in Marinebad by Alain René from 1961. Delphine Syrik plays a woman who meets a man in a mundane location who claims that they have met the year before. He even claims that the two of them had an affair, but she can't remember anything. One could now jokingly claim that this happens sometimes in life for many other reasons. But here, the indirect cut of the film rips the rubber band of temporal continuity. The loss of the sense of continuity lets the viewer look into the abyss of amnesia, just like her. Without chronological reference points, our entire space dissolves, shattering into endless mirrored corridors. So let's move on. On our next level, all of a sudden, the rubber band we are walking on dissolves under our feet. But as it is so true in cartoons, the downfall always comes after the moment of realization. So hang on for a minute. 
How is it that our rubber band shrinks to zero? It seems that it shrinks the more it coincides with our immediate action. Why? Because here our body is affected directly without touching the memory. Only the habitual memory as part of the body reacts automatically, like a machine. At this point, we come across a special picture that I would like to show you. It is called the ergonomic image. It is an image that can look like any other image we know. It even adapts our viewing habit from the cinema and visual culture. And yet it is of a completely different nature. It presents itself as a visual crust of a binary machine language. The ergonomic image bridges an interval where the current becomes virtualized and the virtual becomes the current activity. So, ergonomics, as we all know, is the perfect mutual adaption between the human being and his working conditions. How does this adaption work in the digital working environment, you might ask? How come that it feels like last year in Marine Bad? The uncomfortable answer is, the more we adapt to the digital working environment, the faster the interaction the more we break the bond of continuity. The ergonomic image appeals to our total attention in order to demand our interaction. The perfect ergonomic adaption in reverse is probably illustrated by Cameron's Liquid Man from Terminator 2, a fictitious hybrid machine that also functions as a morphological tool. So let's dig deeper. But before we cross the threshold into the realm of digital technology, let's ask ourselves, what does it mean to be in a virtual space? Do the familiar terms inside and outside still make sense here? Wouldn't it be more appropriate to replace them with the terms attracting and repelling? Are we inside when we stand 10 centimeters in front or 10 centimeters behind a virtual doorstep in Duke Nukem? The question seems almost absurd, doesn't it? when we gaze at the sparkling pixels of spatial simulations. Couldn't we conversely apply those concepts also to natural space? Well, haven't we all experienced how a cold and drafty outdoor space turned into an inner space simply because we met a loved one along the way who warmed our hearts? Conversely, didn't we all experience this ambivalent feeling in the recent months when the lockdown ex ex expelled us into a collective exile. We experienced the spatial alienation within our own four walls and ultimately within our own bodies, which quickly turned into some kind of outsides. To some of us, cocooning was the obvious counter-reaction to cover the uncanny. So in natural space, we experience attraction and repulsion as a mental process. In virtual space, it is more like a chemical or physical process that leads us directly to the next level. In its opening uh, in the early 1970s, no one understood how the whole of human culture could be liquefied into information in a blink of an eye. A few years later, back in 1982, when the Commodore 64 appeared, hardly any one of us thought of Heidegger's remarks who wrote, the power station is not built into the Rhine stream like the old wooden bridge that has connected bank to bank for centuries, rather, the stream is built into the power station. Today it is fair to say digital technology is not built into humanity, but the other way around. Humanity and its entire culture is built into the digital technology, as it is just the resource. So how does the transformation work? The answer is we behave compatibly with the digital, and the conversely, the digital behaves economically with us. By the way, the term compatible derives from the Latin word compatio, which translates to compassion or empathy. The machine, in turn, behaves economically towards us because it wants to adapt itself as best as possible to our body as a tool. This reciprocal principle is the core of the paradigm shift today. So, hardware, UX, UI, AR, clickbaits, tags, etc., etc., on the one side, algorithms of user analysis, blockchain, and now AI on the other side, are the extensions of the ergonomic image in both directions. It would be too much to discuss it all here. So let's focus on the promise of freedom of choice that the ergonomic image offers. 
Its promise says, make your personal director's cut, create your identity, share, like, and so on. But the image selections are neither part of a medium in McLuhan's sense, nor do they have an angelic message. The digital image is therefore not an occasion for contemplation or a reflection on the content of the image. It's only a symbol, optimized under the premise of usability that uh, drives us. The image selection always results in positive reinforcement. We know that as nudging. In other words, today is not longer about working on the image as practiced by the media theory and art history. Today it is about working with the images, or rather their underlying math. This simple insight has enormous implications. To optimize the adaption, the machine must in reverse analyze our user behavior. This is why the city will never be digitally expanded, but simply reorganized according to the rules of technology or those who hold the key. This is the moment when the virtual becomes the actual. Sushana Zuboff describes it in the age of surveillance capitalism, the consequences of our adaption. It is there to automate us and to control us completely. Although the adaption of the machine is highly political, it does not create a community in the sense of Hannah Arendt. So what it does instead is dividing us into interest groups and echo chambers, call it enhanced usability. Digitally enhanced politics is based on a digitally corrupted language. Unsurprisingly, the playbook of populists and modern autocrats is quite simple. One, set whataboutism agendas based on AI sentiment analysis and perpetuate SEO-optimized falsehoods. Two, obstruct critical political discourse and independent press. Three, play democracy whilst mocking democratic institutions. So could that also happen in your country? Also here in Austria? If you're also concerned, then I would like to make a simple suggestion. When the pandemic will soon be over, let's take the white rubber bands of our FFP2 masks and wear them on our wrists. Let's wear them as a sign against any government that subverts our democracy. Let's wear them for structural and legal changes in the misuse of digital technology. At the same time, let us not forget those who did not survive this pandemic. For only our collective memory is what holds societies together and expands cities. With this in mind, let's take it to the streets. Let's expand the rubber brand rally. Thank you.